Quills are quick. An, an alternate universe Sonic the Hedgehog story. Fe featuring Sa Sonic Spade. By Dan Drazen. If I may just keep geek out before I continue reading this. Oh my gosh, 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 Sorry. Back to the fic. Warning. Mature content ahead. Be your discretion is advice. When it isn't raining in San Francisco, it's a good day. That means it's only good day half a time. The other half might not be so easy to get through. That's where I come in. It was pretty slow going for a private eye in those days. I'd never gotten a crack at the big cases. <laughs> Mostly, I've been doing a lot of surveillance work. Assuring wives that hubby wasn't straining on the lease. But even that was drying up because of the war. World War II. You've probably heard of it. It's in all the papers. But I keep showing up to watch the dust settle on my phone. I had been doing my bit to keep the world safe for democracy. Except that Uncle Sam took one look at my flat feet and decided maybe he didn't want me after all. I was only in my office for a few minutes that morning when he entered. He didn't walk in so much as he swept like the fog coming in from San Francisco Bay. He even smelled like the fog. He was tall and stocky, wearing a peacoat. His hat was pulled down low, low over his weathered face. You saw it, Spade? That's my name! They'll wear it out. Captain Jim Canover, Virgin Marine, Master of Portland. You for hire? I'm between cases at the moment. My landlord could have told him that this current moment was three weeks past due the day his rent was due. My wheel man is missing. Here's his picture. He dropped a wallet sized photo on my desk. Name's Carmen Enrico, from the Philippines. We were supposed to cast off two nights ago, but he went and saw, saw that morning and never showed. You checked with the local cops? Maybe he got loaded. He's trying out somewhere. I checked. They don't show him as being picked up. Tried a couple hospitals, too. Even though my landlord was modestly generous with the heat, the captain never unbidden in his cult. So, so, you're taking it, Spade? My fee is 50 a day. Plus expenses. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a sizable wad. He peeled off half a Cena and let it fall into the desk next to Enrico's picture. Whatever else you need, you can collect at the ship. He gave me an address on the waterfront and a pier number, and then left without so much as a fairly well. A missing pair in this case like this wasn't going to get me out of pot with the landlord, but it would buy me some time. Besides, nothing else was clamoring for my undivided attention. I slipped on my trench coat and headed out the door. I stopped on the street and looked around. Above the noise of the traffic, I could hear the newsboy on the corner hawking his papers. The newsman saw, saw me looking at him and gave a quick wave. I knew that kid for the first day he set up shop on my corner. His name's Miles, but everyone called him Tails because he had two. Tails, I mean. Being a newsy ain't much of a life, but it's the only way to go when you're ten years old orphan trying to keep out of the red tape romper otherwise known as the state orphanage. He always managed to stay one step ahead of the new -gooders. When San Francisco's rainy season sets in, I sometimes let him spend the night on the couch in my office. It isn't much of a couch. The leather's as thin as paper and as sports, and you can feel a couple of the lumps move every once in a while. But it beats trying to grab 40 wings at the back alley arms or the doorway Hilton. It was fairly early, so I decided to make conversation. Hi, Sonic! What do you know, little bro? Mostly what I mean in the papers. Anything you know that's not in the morning edition? Lieutenant Sally's two blocks over on Gary Street. Some guy got knocked in the, knocked in the alley. She wouldn't let me see, so it was really ugly. Huh, maybe I'll check it out. You better stay loose, kid. Some lizard came by asking about you the other day. Gave her the old bamboozle. A lizard? Oh no. That's Miss Goodrich. She's with the county. If she gets me, she'll send me away for sure. Listen, kid. Sleeker Gruber's got a better chance of having to tea with the King of England. It'll be cool. Just watch it back. Okay, Sonic. He went back to peddling his papers, and I decided to take a walk up the street to chew the fat with Sally. There weren't many dames on the force in those days. Most of them went into the defense jobs if they worked at all. 
Sally Acorn was cut out to be a lot more than just Rosie the Riveter. She joined the force early and showed a lot of moxie. It's not like she had to work either. Her father was King Acorn, a hotshot movie producer in Hollywood. It tells you something that Sally was willing to make her own way instead of trolling with the country clubs for would-be sugar days with big bucks now and then. So he could eat decent, get some new used clothes, and maybe even see a movie. We shared a tea some charity cases. The lab boys were just finishing up at the crime scene when I got there. I headed toward the lumpy street mid midway down the alley. Put it in park, Spade. What are you doing here? Take it easy, Lieutenant. I'm on a case. Missing person. Thought I'd try my luck. May I? I said as I bent over and took hold of a corner of the seat. Five bucks says he's not your guy. You're on. I knelt down to lift the seat. This wasn't a bad angle to be at. Sally had a pair of legs that went straight up from the ground. Took some real interesting curves here and there and stopped in all the right places. But I could only do about a second's worth of sightseeing. Tails was right. It wasn't pretty. The stiff's head was larger than normal, like someone had tried to balloon it out of shape. His neck was skinny and limp as a punctured bicycle tire. And his expression was the wildest look of fear I'd ever seen. Like he died of fright. But even through all that, I recognized it as my guy. <sighs> I hate cases that don't drag out and run up the bill. I refla replace the seat. You lose, Lieutenant. I showed her the photo the Captain left with me. Merchant Marine, right? You picked those papers? Yes. And we've had two other Merchant Mar Mariners show up dead in the past week. All died the same way. Which was? The lab boys say that their necks were crushed, not broken, just squeezed. All the neck vertebrae were smashed to bits. I thought I'd seen it all. Any prints? Not in the first two. I'm not counting on finding any this time either. Why am I telling you this? His last employer hired me to look for him. I want to be able to do more than shrug when he tells me what happened to the guy. Fair enough. Can't spare any uniforms to give the bad news to... Captain Connor of Portland. You tell him to collect this poor guy at the morgue and I'll make it ten. You're, give it to my favorite charity. What's the big deal that you can't spare a uniform? My office is craw crawling with feds hot on the trail of some kind of spy. News for Robotnik. What's the skating on this Robotnik character? That's Robotnik, Snade, Spade. He's some sort of visiting professor at Berkeley, passing himself off as a Tesco-Vakian engineer. See, paused, glanced over at her shoulders and lowered her voice. But that's not what I heard from the feds who camped out in my office yesterday. They say she, he's an Axis agent, sent over by the Germans. He's supposed to be working on something big. Some kind of super weapon for the Nazis or the Japs. Any leads? Zip. Nothing solid by way of evidence. On top of that, two feds who were supposed to be tiling Robotnik have been reported missing. So the G-men are clearly up my office waiting for him to make a mistake. You think he might be tied into the dead mariners? Without any evidence, your guess is as good as mine. You might as well beat it. A ring if I hear anything. Just make sure you do the same. I headed out of the alley. That tortured, scared look on Enrico's face haunted me every step of the way. When I got to Portland, I filled the captain in on as many details as I got from Sally. He took it without any show of emotion except a biased lip and wondered where he was going to get a replacement whaleman. I told him we were square on expenses and left. On my way down to the gangplank, I watched the ship being loaded. All of the cargo was in huge boxes being guarded by soldiers. War material. Some things you don't have to be a private eye to figure out. I also saw a pile of heavy fur-lined coats being loaded on the board. That told me that Portland wasn't headed for the tropics. Probably for Murmansk or one of the northern ports. I noticed one other thing. Except for the guys loaded the cargo, nobody seemed particularly eager to get underway. That's kind of odd for a ship that should already be at sea. Maybe it was because one of their crewmates got killed, along with two other mariners. Or maybe they were thinking maybe next. One thing was for sure. I wasn't solving this case any faster by taking in the sea air. So I made a quick dash over to the Berkeley side of the bay. Everybody thinks that a private eye gets to lots of car chases and gun battles. I've managed to avoid them by not having either a car or a gun. I 
get to where I want to by beating feet. Jalopies and street cars for slow mos. And when you're fast enough to dodge bullets, you need to be able to fire them. I knew better than to head straight to the campus. I decided to stop in to see Brother instead. He was an ac acquaintance of mine who li lived in a bungalow a couple of blocks off campus. That is, he lived where he wasn't hunkered over a workbench in the garage out back. He was supposed to be a grad student, but it was beginning to look like he'd be making a career out of it. I didn't know how much light he could throw in on this robotic business, but I had to pick his brain a few times on a couple of cases. It seemed worth a try. There didn't seem to be anybody at home when I knocked, so I headed for the back. I was right. A blue light flashed through a crack in the door. Rotor was wielding something or another. I waited a few seconds for the wielding to stop before knocking on the door. The last thing I needed was to take in too much light from a wielder's swords and have to get out of the private eye business in favor of wearing dark glasses and acquiring the pencil consistent on the corner across his tails. Who is it? Well, it's me, Sonic. Come in. You heard of the man who has everything? Sometimes I think that man keeps it all in Rotor's garage. I picked my way through the scrap metal to build a couple of packards. Did I catch you in the middle of something, Rote? Just looks. That's when I saw that Rotor hadn't been wielding at all. He had been using the torch to grill himself a cheese sandwich on an improvised hot plate. What's up? You know anything? You know, what's up? You know anything about a guy, guy on the faculty named Robotnik? About as much as anyone does. I worked for him for two weeks. Not that you could call it working, though. I was a teacher's assistant. Grading papers, taking phone messages, like that. Then, he let me go. What? You didn't get along? That's not it. Robotnik goes through TAs like they were nothing. He hires them, fires them after two weeks or three, and then the whole thing starts all over again. Pretty weird. Actually, that makes sense. If Robotnik was working on something hush-hush, it wouldn't be a good idea for strangers to stay around too long. Better to rotate them after a short time. That way, even if they had put all their heads together, they have a hard time figuring out what he was working on. It was a long short shot, but I asked, Any ideas what it might be? Nah, but I did manage to save this. He crumpled it up one day and pitched it at the trash basket and missed. It rolled into a corner of his office. I was lucky to retrieve it before the janitors got to it. He fished around one pile of junk, unearthed a filing cabinet, opened a drawer, and pulled out a wrinkled piece of paper covered with pencil drawings. Here, I can tell you what it looks like, but I have no idea what it's for. I studied the paper for several seconds. There was something familiar about the drawing, and it took me a second to place it. It looked like a mechanical arm I'd seen once before. When I realized what I was looking at, I handed the paper back to Rotor. You got me, I said. You learn to be cautious in this business. If I had gone all around yelling Eureka, that might have gotten Rotor in trouble if Robotnik had gotten any eyes or ears in the neighborhood. Rotor put the paper back where he got it. I left Rotor's after getting directions to the campus. My first stop was the library. The reference library walked, walked me around the stacks for a couple of hours. I ended up going through the student paper, coming up with a short bio on Robotnik that didn't tell me much of anything. I also got the picture of him. He was a chunky guy with a mustache that looked like it was getting ready to fly south for the winter. Next, I went to the engineering department office and set up an appointment to see Robotnik in a couple of days. I figured if he knew I was looking for him, it might cause him to make a move. I was on my way out of the building when I spotted him. He was entering the building on, by a side door, flanked by a couple of guys wearing pork pie hats and dark glasses. I ruled out doing an on-the-spot interview. Better luck next time. I decided to take the scenic route from the back, which meant that it took me five minutes to get from Berkeley to the Tenderloin District. For me, that's a crawl. I hadn't had once, so I headed for our grubby little diner down Eddy Street from my office. It's also where I hoped to find Bunny. It must have been my lucky day, because I spotted Bunny by herself in the father's booth in the back of the diner. Most of it was the people who knew Bunny didn't want to be seen with her, so it's no wonder she ate in the dining alone. How can I put this in case there are any kids in the audience? Bunny was a working girl. She was in the entertainment field, oldest branch. I hoped I made myself clear. 
I entered the diner and walked over to her booth. She was giving her paternal instincts a workout by nursing a cup of jo joe that could have had helps of water in San Francisco Bay. Busy? I asked as I slid into the booth across the table for her. Well, never too busy for you, sugar hole. If she were at the train station, she'd have to tip a porter double to carry those bags under her eyes. A waitress came by and left a glass of water and a menu in front of me. She gave Bunny a look that was colder than the ice in my glass and walked away. I need to talk to you about your limbs. I hope you ain't thinking about getting anything like them. I want to ask you about the guy who installed that hardware. You mean Dr. Robotnik? That's him. Our waitress, Miss Congeniality, was back at our table. You aren't ready to order my own what? Yeah. The lady will have a blue plate special, and I'll have a chili dog. When I said the word lady, I sort of drew it out to make sure that the waitress got the message. She got it all right. And I got a second helping of Cole's shoulder as he walked back to the kitchen. Don't let her get to her second hog. I'll leave it to you. What's the occasion anyway? Repeal of prohibition, I said as I looked at my water glass. A little ain't late, ain't you, darling? My watch is running slow. Talk to me about Robotnik. Before he got his hands up on me, I never heard of him. But when I had my accident at the Lockheed plant, I thought they was going to take me to a regular hospital. But I was still conscious enough during the ambulance ride to realize that I was being taken to an old warehouse. This fat guy swearing the surgery gown is laying at the loading dock. He looks at me and starts handing a wad of bills to the ambulance crew, like they was getting paid for bringing me to him. That's when I blacked out. I came to, but there were no hospital room. It was like, Four walls put up inside a big old warehouse. I could see the ceiling and the skylights up all over me. Then I saw... She paused to mid-memory to cover her eyes with her hand. Her real one. The waitress came back to our table. She put bunny sticks in front of her as she was competing in the discus throw at the Olympics. As for me, she gave me a plain look at hot dog and a bun along with a cup of sludge that smelled vaguely like chili. I was on my own. Keep this up and Michelin will take away your four-star rating, of course, I cautioned her. She just walked away. Buddy picked up her fork and began picking at the food on her plate. I never did see nothing like them before. These legs in the arm I me. I thought I was going to be sick at first. But then I guess I figured I'd be dead without. That made it a little easier to swallow. Dr. Robotnik saw me a couple of days times a day for the next couple of weeks. Kept on checking my arm and legs, seeing what they could do, having me work out with him, giving me all kinds of tests, but he wouldn't tell me nothing about where I was. I didn't feel too good about that. Finally, I said I wanted to go home, and I said I meant real at home, like Cal leave California. He says, Sure, go ahead. He even framed for the ticket. So he brought me a train ticket back home. You must have not taken him up on his offer. There was just something too creepy about it. So I snuck off the train just as it was about to leave the station. Turned us out, the train jumped the tracks just outside Albuquerque and failed into a canyon. No survivors. I figured the bot link was just to get me, so I went back to doing what I was doing before I got hired at Lockheed. I've been holed up in my hotel room mostly. Only come out to get a bite and eat. Bunny was actually pretty safe this way. If Robotnik was really a secret agent of some sort, it makes sense that he wouldn't endanger his cover by heading over to the red light district and getting arrested. So, you're able to work with those things? Sure, Hog. I figured out how to do things with these here limbs that you've only dreamed of. She so made a move like she was going to reach under the table with her robotic arm. E e ease off, buddy. I whispered. No sense in inviting the fight squad to this little tea party. So, you specialize in guys who like it mechanical? What? Me and I take them off for a couple of regulars who ain't got who got a thing for stones. 
Guess it takes all kinds. Did you ever figure out where the warehouse was that you kept it in? We're in by the bay, that's for sure. I've never heard the wire nor the foghorn or into nothing, just street traffic. That told me as much as I needed to know. I covered Bunny's tab and told her to be careful. She smiled and thanked me. Hey, figured heaven wasn't going to help this particular working girl, so I better do my bit. There weren't that many warehouses that matched the description Bunny gave me, especially ones that were away from the bay. So now it was time to do what I do best, be fate. By the late afternoon, I had been across the city and narrowed it down to three possible locations that either showed for sale or was the name of the owner that looked like just a little too bogus. The prime candidate was over on Brandon near 8th Street. It was supposed to be vacant, and it had a for sale sign on the gate. Thing of it is, there were too many sets of tire tracks leading up to the main gate. Through it and disappearing at the main door to suit me. And the staff of the padlock on the main gate didn't have a lot of rust on it. That meant it had been open and closed. A lot. I circled the place, but I couldn't see any signs of life at the moment. I guess that Robotnik stayed away from the place till dark. I decided to come back in the evening and see if my house was right. I headed back to my office on 8th Street. That's where I saw two guys coming out of my building. I recognized one of them as looking like one of the guys accompanied Dr. Robotnik at Berkeley. The other one had his hat pulled down low over his face, coat collar turned up. Suddenly, I felt like making conversation. I started walking their way, not bothered to hide. I figured if they were looking for me, why make it hard for them? They saw me coming and started walking. I followed. They ducked into a nearby alley. My instincts told me not to follow them. And I didn't feel like listening to outside advice. I went in. I wasn't more than ten feet down the alley when somebody gra grabbed me by the neck from behind. All of a sudden, I had a bad case of deja vu. He started to grip and I started to black out. Hey! <coughs> All of a sudden, whoever it was let go of my neck. I dropped to the alley like a sm smelly kissing canvas. I heard two sets of footsteps on the run. And a familiar voice. You are okay being okie dokie? It was Antoine. He had a dinky office down from the hall from mine. Import-export stuff. The pictures of Gerald de Gaulle he had in his office told me his heart was in the right place. Even though the rest of him was over here, instead of being back in France, some part of resistance group. Helped me to my feet. <clears throat> I'm fine. <clears throat> I said, clearing my throat. I was seeing those two shady characteristics at your office. They made to break in, so I made the noise. Scared them off. Now I fuzzed them out just to make sure they were going away. Get a look at either of them. I could not be telling from the back. I just saw them out. Ugh. Good thing it did. I owe you one. It is my pleasure, Sonic. I was certain now that Robotnik was starting to get concerned about me. That he was playing for keeps. I knew I couldn't afford to make a mistake like going down that alley again. Don't know why, but it occurred to me that it was past time that the examiner, evening paper, hit the streets. I should have been able to hear Tails hawking it like he did every day. Didn't hear him. I also could have should have been able to see Tails from where I was standing. I couldn't. Hey, you see what happened to Tails? Is the new shape of boy? We. Oui. He was talking to someone about ten minutes ago. I was seeing them from my office when I heard Z2 would be burglars. Wait a minute. Who was the someone? He was speaking. It's because it like fucked with the monsters out to here. Robotic. I knew then that he had something to do with whatever it was who tried to turn my neck bone into powder. Now that he had apparently grabbed tails, this was personal. I dashed back to the warehouse, circled around it, but couldn't see any signs of life. I figured I mu must have beat Robotnik here, so I waited. A couple of minutes later, car pulled up to the gate, while someone 
got out, unlocked the gate, and opened it. The gar car drove through, and the gate locked again. Then the car disappeared in the warehouse. Something told me Sally might be interested in this. I found a nearby payphone, and get gave her the address, and hung off. As for me, I wasn't in the mood to wait until the cavalry arrived. It was getting dark. That suited me just fine. I juiced over the fence and walked over to a wooden side door. It was locked. But I wasn't going to let a little thing like that stop me. Some private eyes get all macho at a time like this and suit the lock off. Others, with more refinement, try picking the lock. Me? I got my own variation. Going into a spin, I hit the door running, turning into toothpicks. Works every time, but I ruined more trench coats that way. It was dark inside. Couldn't see how far the warehouse interior extended. But that wasn't going to stop me either. I started walking into the darkness, expecting I had cattle robotic one way or the other. Just then, an overhead light in the ceiling stepped on. Sonic Spade, I presume? I hate it when I'm right. It was Robotnik's voice. Please come in, Mr. Spade. I have been expecting you. The voice came from somewhere in the darkness around me. He could have had it a hundred times because he was trained on me, and I wouldn't have known it. Somehow, I figured he wanted to talk first. The really teeth crooks always do. I also figured he might need a prompting. We both know what's going on, Robotnik. So why not go easy? So that's Robotnik! And you intend to bring me in by yourself? <laughs> if I have to. That a guy could laugh out of the guy. <laughs> You're in over your head. More than you possibly could imagine. Allow me to show you. A light came on at the center of the room. There were two figures standing there. Then I realized they were two guys I had seen with Robotnik back at Berkeley. These gentlemen figured that they could apprehend me as well. Take a good look at them, Mr. Hedgehog. They represent your future and the future of the world. Who can resist an invitation like that? I walked over to the guys who were standing there, like department door win window dummies. Something was weird about their skin. It looked like some kind of rubber shell. I felt it. It was cold as metal. What did you do to them? I called out. Only make them more pliable. The voice said from nowhere. Their minds are under my exclusive control. And their bodies have become living biomechanical instrumentalities. Once the roboticization process has been perfected on a mass scale, it should make controlling a conquered populace that much easier. You still gotta cast your conquer them first, Robotnik. That's Robotnik, you impotent robot! But don't worry. I've made arrangements for that as well. Let me introduce you to... My storm bots. A light came on as far at the end of the room. There were maybe a half dozen mechanical men just standing there. I served the hands on them. Not as agile as human hands, I grant you, but extremely versatile. They could close around someone's neck like a vice. And that's how you've been murdering these merchant seamen, right? I needed to test their capabilities. And it seemed to be an advantage to disrupt the shipment of war material by the Allies at the same time. But allow me to demonstrate. The Starbucks woke up and raised their arms. I had a hunch they weren't about to walk over and shake hands. Sure enough, it was like a fall. They had a machine guns mounted in their arms. They sent out a volley of bullets in my direction, and I figured it was time to get out of the rain. I pushed the roboticized team men out of harm's way, and dodged the first wave of lead, cut back behind the stern bots. Hey! Looking for me? The ten men needed a couple of seconds to figure out where I was and retarget. That was more than enough time for me. I went back into spin mode and plowed into them. They fell over and laid there like beach turtles. They didn't give up, though, and tried targeting me from a horizontal style of persistence. I started circling them, and they ended up targeting each other. It took less than a minute for them to shoot each other to pieces. Very 
Impressive, Mr. Spade. I could tell that he wanted to use some other word instead. I had designed my stone bus for combat, not for street buying, and certainly not for your unorthodox style. So I don't like standing around waiting to get shot. Sue me. I shouted at the darkness where Robotnik's voice was coming from. Let's see what else you got. What I got, wrote it, is my masterpiece, the Blitz Bolt. I heard one of the warehouse fire doors being opened, and I turned. I thought I was ready for anything, but I wasn't quite ready for this. Robotnik's Blitz Bot looked like one of his storm bots. But it was, must have been ten feet tall, but that wasn't the worst of it. Help! Sonic! It was Tails. Robotnik's giant robot was gripping him in one hand. What do you think you're doing with Tails? I demanded. I thought that we get your attention. You leave the kid alone! I wouldn't dream of harming him. Some of my superiors in the upper echelons of the Reich have, so we say, and then affinity for boys such as this one. He would fetch me cool to hit some sum. That did it. Normally, I look out for myself. But when I heard Robotnik talking about tails like that, this blue dude just started seeing red. Okay, Butnik, if you want me, you got me. Just let the kid go. Apparently, you can't be reasonless. Robotnik stepped out of the shadows flanked by some storm bots. He was wearing a red uniform that looked more like a jumpsuit. It reminded me of Herman Gehrig with a sunburn. What about the kid? You do have a red trick mind, don't you? The blitz bot put Tails down, but he put him down into a chair where he was bound and gagged by a storm bot. I thought you said you were going to let him go! Only after I'm satisfied with the results of the test. Something told me that this wasn't the kind of te test you can't you can cram for. Blue spot! Destroy that hedgehog! The big bot made a lunge for me and just about swatted me like a fly. Fortunately, I was just a little too fast for him. Okay, I thought that's how you wanted to play it. I ducked to my left and the blitz bot took another swing at me. I tied it so that he ended up pulverizing one of the Robotnik's storm bots. I figured if they liked it once, they'll love it twice. Another dash of fake and the second storm bot was out of commission. Now the odds were a little more comfortable with me and the blitz bot. Going into spin once more, I lost myself at the bot, but all I succeeded in doing was ricocheting off the tin man's chest and crashing it to the floor. So much for the direct parts. Unfortunately, I don't have a blind beat to fall back on. I dashed to the door where I come through and out to the yard by the gate. I needed time to think. The blitz fought didn't give me any time. Next thing I knew, there was a loud crash coming from the warehouse roof. I looked up to see that the blitz fought was coming out through the spotlight. Just some flames were drooling out of his legs. His head swiveled like he was coming for me. Great! He can fly. Well, I couldn't fly. But I could run. If Butnik wanted to test his flying machine, I'd give him a test. I tore out toward the hills, but the blitz bot kept on following me. I then turned around and headed back into town, thinking I could lose him in the traffic. No good. He was still on my tail. I needed time to think, and the blitz bot wasn't giving me any. I could only keep running. I kept up running, and the blitz bot kept following me. I dashed up and down the streets. Up and down hills, dodging autos and streetcars. All the while, the blitz fight was close behind and getting closer. If anybody has a copy of City Escape, I think now is a good time to play it. Maybe someday, somebody will make a game out of all this. It starts people two bits of play, but I wasn't in a playful mood. Then I had an idea. I didn't know where it was any good or not, but there was only one way to find out. I did a quick 180 and headed back for the warehouse. I was back in the main gate in a couple of seconds. I took a quick look over my soldier. Sazzle Pace was right. Someone, or something, was getting on me. But the question was, would he be ready? <laughs> Not only could I stop on a dime and give you 9 cents change, I take chorus pretty well as well. 
I only had one shot and I had to make it count. I headed straight for the warehouse door, which was still shut. The blood spot was still on my tail. At the last possible moment, I feared to the left. The blood spot was so agile. It plowed into the door. Second layer, he had spare parts. I finally had a chance to catch my breath and looked around. Only then did I notice all the cop cars parked around the place. Sally must have gotten my message. I stepped inside. I saw Sally listening to tales. From the way the kid was gesturing, he must have been telling her how Robotnik had put the arm on him. I decided to join the party. Tails stopped mid-story and ran over to me. He clamped onto me like I was a winning lottery ticket. Usually, I don't like it when someone gets sloppy all over me. And I didn't mind it this time. What did I miss? I asked Sally. Only a major collar. She nodded over to where a couple of fireman packed sheep men were hauling Robotnik away in cuffs. I got your message. We pulled up just as soon as things sit past us. I saw tales of Robotnik inside, so I thought I'd invite myself in and ask a few questions. Robotnik was coy at first. Then that giant tin can made its grand entrance. I figured you had something to do with that. I arched one eyebrow in her what direction. When Robotnik saw that the giant robot was about to go to pieces, he was in shock. Then he started singing like all three Andrew's sisters. Hey, Lieutenant Acorn! One of the cops called out. What well, about the kid? He ain't got no papers. Do we send him over to duty hall or what? I had forgotten about Tails. And these were the regular beat cops who knew they could leave Tails alone. I may run fast, but it was a good thing Sally could think fast. It's okay, Sally called out without missing a beat. The kid belongs to speed. Sonic, you didn't tell me your nephew Miles was in town from Puma. She knelt down and mussed out the kid's hair. I quickly whispered, follow my lead. Yeah, I said getting up to speed. <laughs> Guess he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Next time, Sonic, if you can't get a sitter, leave the little squeaker at home when you're on a case. She had that tone in her voice that made me want to stand in a corner. She was good. Anyway, that satisfied the cops, and they turned their attention back to the remains of the foot spot. Why did you have to tell him my real name for Sally? Tails whined. Well, excuse me for wanting to keep you out of the joint. So, what happened with Robotnik? I asked. He belongs to the feds now. Let them make sense out of his story. He says he could turn the two G-men from being zombies or whatever they are. I think he hopes they'll go easy on him if he does. He also claims he was Del Felby to Blitzbot for use by the Japanese. There was supposed to be a part prototype for an army of them. Also, I think he was creating Snatchers, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah, right. Like the Japs would ever be interested in giant flying robots. It looked like it was going to rain again by the time Robotnik had been taken away in a paddy way. The party at the warehouse broke up. Sally headed back to the police headquarters and I took Tails back to my office. I started making myself a pot of java. As for Tails, he was asleep as soon as he hit his head hit the leather. Get sleeping Tails! Get take it! I walked over to the window in my office and stared out. It was starting to rain again. I thought about Sally, probably up to her beautiful hips and paperwork on this Robotnik case. Robot Rotor was still probably hunched over his work beds. Antoine was probably turning in a shortwave radio to catch the news from Europe. Bunny was in a hotel room on Eddy Street, getting ready to give some insurance adjuster from Mill Valley a hand shot he'd take with him to his grave. And Dales was curled up on my ratty old cats. Dreaming the kind of dreams that keep Orphus going for one more day. It may have been the rain. It may have been the sound of the police siren cutting through the night like the wail of a lonely saxophone. All of a sudden, it was just like everything that happened today sort of faded and became meaningless. Just when you think you've accomplished something in this business, just when you want to congratulate yourself on having saved the world, you want to remember that this world is made up of a lot of lost souls just going through the motions to get it back. People whose problems manage to get crowded off the front page by bigger things like the war. Before you know it, 
patting yourself on the back because it feels like kicking yourself in the can. I needed to change scenery. I unplugged the coffee pot, put on my coat, pulled my hat down low, and walked quietly past Tails where he was sleeping. Closed and locked my office door, and stepped out into the cold, wet night. I headed up to where Bunny was doing business. I felt the need to, for a lesson in applied robotics. Yes, people. Casey, I'm not noticed. Yes, I really, really enjoyed this story in really only 40 minutes. <laughs>